Thank you, Kathy, Jim, and Krista. Appreciate your music leadership today. Our band had a work conflict today, at least a few of them, in the form of a golf tournament. And instead, they are here singing with you because it is pouring down rain. And I love these selections of songs. We don't always think about what we are singing as we worship. I know all of us are a little guilty of that if it's familiar. But deep cries out to deep. Have you ever wondered what you're saying? One place that's found in the Bible is Psalm 42, where the psalmist says, as the deer pants for the water. And he's lamenting. He's talking about how he longs to be in worship with people again. And he's mourning. And then in verse 7, he says, deep cries out to deep. Don't we all need for the Holy Spirit to help us in our expression of our heart? Only the Lord knows how to speak to us in our most difficult places, in our broken places, in the places where we lament, as well as in the places of our celebration. It's good to worship. It's good just to be in God's presence. I want to invite you to turn with the Bible to the book of Acts. Aha, they're saying, the book of Acts again. You thought I was finished with this series on the book of Acts, but here we go. We've been in a longer process as a church, in case some of you are not aware, thinking about the future of our church. And last weekend we had a significant gathering of our church all day on Saturday. And if you don't believe in miracles, we filled our fellowship hall all day on a Saturday, the first Saturday of the summer season, basically. And it was a really valuable time of processing together, hearing from one another, asking the Lord to direct us. And so soon, just to give you an update, soon we will begin to see the draft of an actual vision statement. Actually, the report that's going to come back to us is about 30 pages long, just so you know. It's not just one little pithy statement (laughs) to say this is where we think we're going. It's an assessment of all they heard about our weaknesses and our strengths and our opportunities and our challenges and the opportunity for us to look forward together in some planning. So that strategic planning will come. I've heard from some of you. But where was the specifics of the strategic planning? And I'm saying, you don't want to do that with 70 people in the room. Can I get an amen? (laughs) It's really true. But we need to hear from each other. And I was so thankful that we were able to do that. As we turn to the book of Acts, I want to uh, just today introduce the book of Acts a little differently than what I've been saying before. I want you to think of the book of Acts as the fulfillment of a vision. There is a structural statement in the book of Acts. It comes in Acts... Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Is that better? Acts 1.8. And this serves as an outline. You remember Luke wrote the book of Acts. He's very detailed. He's a historian. He wants to present things in ways we'll understand. So he actually gives you a three-part outline of what's going to happen for the rest of the book of Acts. Jesus says, the resurrected Christ, to his disciples, he says, you're going to be my witnesses, and then it's geographical from there. And that's how the book of Acts is laid out. I don't know if you're aware of that, but he's talking about being witnesses first where they're at in Jerusalem, and then in the surrounding areas in Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. And this actually forms a structure. Uh, There's a basic timeline for the resurrection of Christ to the death of Paul. But just to set this so we can get this in our minds, because as we think about a vision, as we think about what God has said to us and how we're going to fulfill that, I want us to keep our eye on Scripture. This is actually a picture of what it looked like in that time period in their generation for fulfilling this vision that God had given them. It's a fascinating read, this book of Acts. It's incredible what happened in just 30-some years as you begin to think about how they went from just a group, um, perhaps of hundreds, to a group of tens of thousands, literally, within 30 years. God was very busy. Starts in Jerusalem, that's Acts 1 through 8. A couple significant things happen. God's preparing the church and God's creating the church. You read about Peter and you read about Stephen and their ministries together and his martyrdom. 
And then it expands to the Judea and Samaria part. That's in Acts 9 through 12. I'm giving you some context for what I want to talk about here today. We see Philip preaching. We see uh, Paul's conversion, which becomes really significant for the rest of Acts. Uh, Cornelius is converted. And that's really important because, of all things, Cornelius is a Gentile. I'm telling you, this was earth-shattering for this church. It caused all kinds of ruckus. It caused all kinds of, wait a minute, the church is changing. (laughs) What do you mean? The Gentiles are welcome too. And what's that going to mean for us? We see the first missionary journey with Paul and Barnabas, good old Barnabas. We talked about him a couple weeks ago. Paul and Barnabas go through Asia Minor and they begin to uh, plant churches and they begin to share this news. And then it extends to the ends of the earth and the rest of the book of Acts. We see the rest of Paul's missionary journeys. Some think of his going to Rome as his fourth missionary journey. He simply, he certainly had converts there. But you know he didn't go to Rome on his own terms, right? We learned in Romans 1 that Paul always wanted to go to Rome. He had planned to go to Rome many times, he writes them. But he was always prevented from doing so. Paul ends up going at the end of his life to Rome to be executed. And all the way through, he still has this vision that he's going to be a witness of Jesus even in his chains. And so we have some of his letters that he wrote from even being in those kind of circumstances. The Jerusalem Council is a glorified committee meeting. You got to love Acts chapter 15, right? You love committee meetings? They got together. (laughs) Some of you are really not sure about that. It's true. That's a recorded business meeting in Acts chapter 15, but it's fascinating. They heard from everyone. They didn't draw on apostolic authority to say, yeah, that's the way it's going to be. They all heard each other. And then it says, after much discussion. It's one of my favorite phrases in the book of Acts. It's such an understatement. If you're a pastor, you get that, right? After much discussion. This is a really wise recording clerk, right, of this committee. Let's not put in all the details in the minutes, okay? After much discussion, it seemed good to the Spirit and to us. And it lays out for them what the church is going to look like moving forward. And actually, it has some really tight moral parameters about sexual immorality and some other things. Did you know that? They're talking about what it looks like for the gospel to go into the culture without the culture changing the gospel. What parts of a vision being fulfilled can change and what parts have to always stay the same? And they wrestle through that. And I'm going to say that they even fight as a church. I mean, I'm reading between the lines. But there is disagreement in the book of Acts about these things. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit to lead us, wouldn't you say? I mean, more than anything, we want God's vision for us, God's strategic plans, God's initiative to move forward. And so today I'm just going to kind of talk more about vision. I'm going to center from Acts 16 to 18. I'm just going to bring out some bits. I want to give you some encouragement of what it looks like as a church when we're fulfilling a vision from this picture of Acts. You know, we sat for several hours last weekend. We talked about vision. I'm going to share a couple things that rose to the surface for me. And there is, like I say, there's a statement being drafted. You notice that Acts 1.8 is geographical. I also want you to know that it's cultural. In fact, I think that's more important than the geography. Luke is laying out the organization of the book of Acts for us to understand, just like he did with the Gospel of Luke. It's very orderly. He writes to set out an orderly account. He wants them to know what happened in the life of Jesus. And as soon as Christ is resurrected through the death of Paul, by the way, are you all Bible nerds? You're saying no because you don't want me to keep going. I can see that. I can see your faces. (laughs) Acts and Luke used to be one book. It has been separated in our canon. It used to be one book. It's all one history of the work of Christ. Did you know that? Acts was never a label Luke anyway. I'm just saying, this is the continuation of Jesus' work. And it's organized geographically, but it's organized culturally. The culture between Jerusalem to Judea Samaria was significant. There were incredible barriers for them to overcome. What what do you mean we're going to suddenly let in all these people who are different than we are? We thought that Jesus, from a Jewish background, what that meant was 
Yes, we're going to be followers of Christ because he's the fulfillment of all this Old Testament, and we understand that. And of course, we're going to keep all of the law of the Old Testament. What does it mean to suddenly do what we're doing with integrity and change at the same time? And so, like I said, Cornelius and this vision that Peter has of all people, uh, that suddenly all these things are permissible and they meet together and they have this decision about it. I just want to point this out. As I was thinking about that from the book of Acts, I was thinking about our vision day last Saturday. Something that came out over and over and over in our vision. I'm sure you're going to see it in there. I'm sure I'm going to see it in there. The Genesis group is working on it. Our vision task force will see it, blah, blah, blah. We will see this emphasis on growing young. Did you hear that a lot on Saturday? Teresa mentioned it as well. We care about younger generations. We do not want to age out as a church. And that means that every one of us, regardless of our station, have something to contribute to the next generation. And I love that. Because as we mature, we realize life isn't just about me anymore, right? Life is about investing outside of me. That's not easy. Because I can be so comfortable in Jerusalem. I can be so comfortable in my bubble. I can be so comfortable in my tradition and the way I like to do things. But I think Acts is incredibly challenging of a generation of people who were willing to listen to what God said and to put that into practice in such a way that they made themselves very uncomfortable. Generational. If our vision will be anything, it'll be a cross-cultural experience. You've heard of the generation gap, right? Do you believe generation gaps are significant? Do you believe that they're real? We had one young adult at every table, and they spoke a lot, and I love that and appreciate that. And I could tell that from our young adults, the generation gap is real. And I have to tell you, that's kind of hard for me to hear. I've been hearing it for a couple of years, so I was ready for it, right? But when I first started hearing it, do you remember we did the millennials, Gen Xers workshop thing a few years ago? When I was hearing all that, I was like, what? I'm cool. <laughs> I'm still young. What do you mean? I mean, it begins with awareness. Am I right? I'm not young anymore. <laughs> not, by, not by many people's eyes. And I have to mature and I have to get outside of myself. And I think that that is what the Acts, the Acts Church went through as well. Is to say, what do you mean the church may not look like what it looked like yesterday? And I think it would have been harder for them, frankly, because, you know, Jesus was there, right? Jesus went to Jerusalem and celebrated the Passover, right? John says he was there at least three times during his public ministry. We know that this was part of it. We know that he memorized scripture. The Torah was important to him. We know all that stuff. Imagine the cultural shift in the book of Acts. And what I'm saying is that kind of a shift is biblical. Do you know it? What should you expect when fulfilling a vision of God, it's going to be a vision that's bigger than what we can do, and it might be bigger than what we like. And aren't you glad that I'm not trying to act young when I'm not? What our young adults have said a few years uh, running now is what we really want, Ken, is for your generation to know us, to hear us, to listen to us, to know that the Holy Spirit speaks to us as well. And heaven forbid you get up there and start acting young with skinny jeans and, and a big beard, whatever else. You don't need it. We don't want it. We can see right through that. And I appreciate that very much. We talked about outreach and impact. We talked about getting outside of ourselves as a church. And you want to talk about a culture shift. I came from outside of the church and came into the church without any background of Sunday school and where anything is in the Bible and everything else. And so I understand that culture <laughs> a lot better than this growing young thing because, you know, none of us grew up knowing the younger generation. Does that make sense? Every generation's had to go through this stuff of learning, of learning, of learning. I heard about a mom who texted her son. She texted her son and said, son, what does IDK, ILY, and TTYL mean? 
And the son replied back, I don't know. (laughs) You know where this is going. I love you. Talk to you later. And of course, the mom replied, okay, don't worry about it. I'll ask your sister. (laughs) And I love you too. And if you didn't get that, nudge your neighbor. They'll tell you what that's really all about. I want us to think of ourselves as missionaries. I want us to think of our church as missional. You don't have to go overseas to have that mindset. When we know that we're on mission, we're willing to do things that make us uncomfortable. Our speaker at the Friends Church Multiplication Conference was an elderly person. He was probably in his 70s, sorry. He, he was older than I am, okay? And he described a time when he was on a short-term mission in Africa. And he said that in that service, for one thing, it was very different for him and uncomfortable because they went two to three hours for a worship service. And when they took an offering, they played music, and everyone made their way down the aisle in the front and placed the gift at the altar. But the thing is, they danced while they did it. And everybody was rhythming (laughs) and making noise, and that was what he was saying. He was raised Nazarene. He didn't know how to dance. (laughs) All that he knew about dancing was from the 70s. You pointed your finger and things like that. had no idea what to do, but because he was on mission, he went down that aisle dancing as well as he could. And in reflecting on that experience, just can't get that out of my head, his description of that. He said, When we're on mission, we're willing to be uncomfortable. When we're not on mission, it just feels like a problem, right? It feels like an issue (laughs) that we need to have a committee meeting about. (laughs) It doesn't feel like something that I'm doing for the Lord. It doesn't feel like something that I'm doing for someone else. And the book of Acts is about a group of people who understand this vision that they are to be Christ's witnesses in every place that they are and among every different kind of people that they are. I'm excited for the vision. I'm looking forward to what happens next. We don't have the nuts and bolts yet. It'll take some time. But let me offer some encouragements about what I hope we can expect. Are you ready? These won't be what you expect. But this is what's here in the book of Acts. Um, By the way, Acts 16 to 18 is the launching of the second missionary journey in that history I just gave you. Here's what happens. This is the introduction to, are you ready? This is the introduction to the second missionary journey. This is a big moment, right? Bible history folks, you know this. This is a big deal, right? Here it is. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back to visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. So the first missionary journey, he and Barnabas went throughout Asia Minor. They planted churches with this idea for a second missionary journey, regroup, let's go back and check on all those churches. Now Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, traditionally the author of the Gospel of Mark, right? Pretty important person in in the whole scope of the Bible. Barnabas wanted to take John with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him. Because he had deserted them in Pamphylia. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Does this kind of stuff happen in the first century? I mean, I want our church to be the first century church. Oh, you mean the church where people desert other people in the middle of the mission? Yeah, that that one. There's problems in the first century church. Deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. If you're surprised by that, get this. Paul and Barnabas, do you remember? There are two heroes. Paul and Barnabas had such a sharp disagreement, and the word sharp is an emphatic description of the kind of disagreement that our heroes had with each other. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, and later he picked up Timothy, the one that he was mentoring, right? We all have to have a Barnabas, and we all have to have a Timothy. He picked up his Timothy, Silas, 
And Luke joins them in chapter 16. Because it's interesting, Luke, the author of it all, he starts to say we instead of they as he records through Acts. Isn't that interesting? I think so. <laughs> um, so instead, it, it just didn't look at all like what they thought it would look like. And they had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. But they were commended by the brothers by the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia strengthening the churches. The first thing that this church encounters as they attempt to go worldwide beyond Judea and Samaria is conflict. And I think it's really important that we, that we have our eyes wide open that conflict is always going to happen within the church. Isn't it surprising? Even though I firmly believe that Paul and Barnabas were Holy Spirit led, who here is going to deny the maturity of those believers? I mean, who here is going to deny that the Spirit used both of them in dynamic, powerful, amazing ways? Our generation can hardly criticize that 30-year period of history for what they accomplished for the gospel. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, if anything, we are going the wrong direction in, in terms of the spread of the gospel, at least in this country and mainline churches like ours. I mean, this is incredible that even within that, there is conflict. Ken, why would you bring that up? <laughs> I mean, that's so negative. I bring it up because it's what's here. It's what's in the Bible. And I'm bringing it as an encouragement because it doesn't stop the Holy Spirit from doing what the Holy Spirit can do. The thing I notice about these two mature believers is that they bless each other and they go different ways. This isn't, this isn't the picture that we would expect. This happens in churches, doesn't it? This isn't the picture that we expect. It's, it's not what we hope for. It's not what we plan on. But I hope we can understand that sometimes it is okay to go separate directions and to totally bless each other. Actually, the ministry is multiplied. Do you see that? So it's not just Paul and Barnabas. It's Paul, Barnabas, Mark, Silas, Timothy, Luke. There's, there's a multiplying as they're able to surrender their agenda. That's, that's the hard thing about a vision and change and going cross-cultural and people having different ideas about what's important. You can picture the argument, can't you? The sharp, I call it an argument because it's a sharp disagreement in the Greek. It's an argument. I can picture it. You remember Paul, the persecutor of Christians, and the disciples wouldn't trust him? Who was the only person that believed in him? Barnabas. Yeah, there was Ananias, but Barnabas. Barnabas is the one who commended Paul to those disciples and said, trust me, he's genuine, he's for real, you can believe him. And because of that, Paul has this incredible ministry in Troas. I mean, think about that. You can picture Barnabas, and, and then there's Paul. Paul's like this natural leader with a big personality. He's not necessarily the encourager in my mind, as I read between the lines of the pages of Scripture, the mission is everything. And so Paul is saying, look, we can't compromise. We couldn't count on him back in Pamphylia. He deserted us. We don't know why, if it was too hard, if he was homesick or whatever it was. But it almost comes across as if they, he just suddenly wasn't there. And Paul says, we cannot do that. This mission is too important. God has called us, actually, I'll get to it in a second, to Europe. It's a big deal. We can't have a deserter in our ranks. And you can picture Paul firing right back, right? Well, Paul, where would you be if it weren't for me? <laughs> so let me ask you, which one of these two was right? What's interesting to me about the book of Acts is that Luke, who happened to be on one of the teams, does not say, does not say. And isn't it true that there are times when we have to come to that place to humble ourselves and say, bless you, bless you. I don't believe that God calls us 
to kill each other with arguments as a church and ruin our witness. Bless you. You're going a separate way. And it is one of the hardest things to do. And they do it well. Second surprise, are you ready? If you get serious about pursuing something that's too hard for you to do, and, and you just want what God wants as a church, as an individual, whatever, you're going to find closed doors. And it's going to surprise you. This little section from uh, Acts 16, it's one of my favorite sections. And I kept thinking about Acts 16 all through the pandemic. When we'd like make these plans, none of those plans happened. So we'd make those plans. None of those plans happened. So we'd make the other plans. None of the other plans happened. And there was just this, like, treading water of how do we plan? How do we know what's next? And let me tell you, the landscape of the church, just look around. It looks very different today than it did two and a half years ago. And it was so impossible to predict. So get this. I, I think Paul could identify a little bit with this pandemic thing. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia, and Galatia. So he, he's ready to go. He's had his disagreement. He's, he's ready to go wherever God sends him. And he has an idea of where he wants to go. Having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia, he wanted to go to Asia. But when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. Isn't that curious? I mean, I'd like to know what that looked like. Was it like Balaam's donkey or something? Did, did an inanimate object like a bush start talking to him in flames? Or... Somehow he knew it was the Holy Spirit, so they passed by Mysia. We'll go down to Troas. During the night, by the way, I have to say something about Troas. Troas is a little town. It's like the one stoplight, the one gas station. It is not the strategic place to launch a worldwide crusade. <laughs> but it's in Troas that Paul has a vision of the man of Macedonia. Do you know what that is? That is what Paul needed. So that's modern day Greece. That's in Europe. This is, this is the launching of the church beyond the borders, even of what Paul expected. You mean, really? It's unexpected. But isn't it true that sometimes God has to take us down to Troas to hear his voice? How do you handle Troas in your life? When you try to go to Bithynia, when you try to go to Asia, when you try to go this way and that way and the other way and it just felt like there's closed door after closed door after closed door. I know for me, sometimes I just need to be humbled in what I think. I need to be humbled in what I plan. And to me, it has felt like God doing that with our church in this last season of stopping us in our tracks over and over and over again so that we would be ready flexible. One of the best things about the pandemic for the church, forced flexibility. I remember announcing to you by email that our church was going to go strictly online. I thought this church is like 56 years old and I could give you a dozen reasons that will never happen, that our church will go strictly online. But all of a sudden, here we are and here we go. And I have loved how you as a church have walked with us through this. You've done it with humor. You've done it with grace. You've done it with consistency. And hanging in there. If you are within the sound of my voice, you hung in there. Those online, those that are here, I'm grateful. And I almost feel like if God has a vision that's bigger for us, like Greece big, like going to Macedonia big, like something you wouldn't expect that's going to break all the bubbles. I think he has to humble us. I think he has to teach us that church isn't just those things that we think we want to hang on to and say, that's, that's church, that's us. Our identity should only be in Jesus Christ. It should, it should only be about where he says to go and why and how and when. I mean, Paul's a superman, but in that passage, he's a Clark Kent. 
He's nearsighted. He has no idea where he's going. And he totally needs God to show him. And I think that's going to happen to us quite a bit in fulfilling our vision. I do. I want us to expect it. I want us to look forward to it. I want us to celebrate it. Because what happens in the book of Acts isn't about these amazing people. It's about the Holy Spirit. You know, I believe the Holy Spirit's still writing the book of Acts, of course. You know, Jerry and Carrie from our church are in Ecuador right now exploring a mission field with the Shuar people. And, and if you read what they've sent to our church, I mean, it is like the book of Acts, what they're going through. A canoe ride to a village, really? <laughs> I mean, crazy stuff. But for that matter, we are the ends of the earth, aren't we? We're ready in Idaho. Imagine Paul being sent here. Begging him, come over to the Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once. As soon as they knew, they were willing. I don't know. I'm just saying, I don't think this is going to be easy. Is that okay? I really don't. It'll be one thing to get this statement that says, this is our vision, and, I, and I'm excited about it. I believe God spoke to us last weekend. I really, really do. Our task right now is just to clarify that in writing so that we can all say, yep, that was it. That's how, that's how he's speaking. We're getting there. But once we do, I don't want us just to put posters on the wall with a rainbow and some kind of a victorious mountaintop climber saying, there it is. You're familiar with those kind of posters you saw in your grade school, right? You can do it. Are you familiar with despair.com? No? Despair.com publishes demotivators. Have you heard of these? They're not motivational posters. They're demo. I don't know if I should show them looking at your responses. I'm not sure. But here goes. The journey of thousands of miles sometimes end very, very badly. Are you motivated? Oh, boy. I just have one more. I'm really glad. I could have picked like 10 of these. Humiliation. The more you try, the dumber you look. Do you like it? <sighs> Deep breath. I'm just trying to say we cannot take ourselves too seriously. And I really do think that the bigger the vision, the more you might look like that. And your skis and your gloves like a yard sale going down the hill. And it's okay. The thing that I notice about Paul and what happens in the book of Acts is they just kept going. They did. They didn't just say, oh, we tried that, it didn't work. They kept going. And I love that about them. And I want that for our generation. I want us to be faithful because the Lord knows we have huge ob obstacles <laughs> to overcome at this time. Don't you feel blessed that God trusted us with this generation? What is he thinking? He knows what he's doing. You know, Paul later on would make it, of course, to Europe, and he would make his way to Corinth, which isn't far from Philippi, where this man of Macedonia was. And when he got to Corinthians, I love what he said, and I read this passage of Scripture my first Sunday at Meridian, France. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear with much trembling. I read that to you when I was 25 years old, Meridian. I read that to you today. I want a vision that's bigger than my ability or my background or my understanding or your ability or your background or your understanding. We need to come into this with fear and trembling. Not pretending to know things we do not know, but only knowing Jesus. And in fact, being willing to lay ourselves down. Being willing for God to close doors. Being willing for God to say no. Being willing for God to humble us, to prepare us for what he has. This has to be our mindset. Last thing that I'm sure will encourage you. <laughs> Conflict at closed doors on a rainy Sunday. What could be better? This is better than the fairways, don't you think? <laughs> The painful answer. <laughs> Paul is surprised by common people. <laughs> Would you nudge somebody next to you and say you're a common person? 
Would you please? <laughs> I didn't leave myself a lot of time to talk about it, but that is exactly what Paul finds when he finally starts this huge second missionary journey and this vision of a man of Macedonia and this incredible fireworks that are about to happen and the church literally going worldwide. The things that the Holy Spirit did in the book of Acts are just profound. They're amazing. They're incredible. But do you remember who the first convert in Europe was? It's Lydia. One of those listening was Lydia. Where, so Paul went down to a river. He couldn't find a synagogue there. And there wasn't one. That was his strategy in mission. He, he was strategic, always. This is how I'm going to accomplish a vision. I'm going to evangelize the city. He wanted to go to Rome because that's like the center of the world, but no dice. He wanted to go this way to Asia. He wanted to go that way. God put him in Philippi. And by the way, that's why Paul could never be a successful baker. It took him three years to fill a pie. Incredible, right? So we're saying, I don't get it. I'm not sure I get it. <laughs> That's not why they're not laughing. Huh? Yeah, okay. So Paul goes to Philippi. One of those listening, when he was down at the river, so they go to the river because that's the next likely place for religious people to be, for a cleansing, for baptism. Those who would have been from Jewish descent and had some scriptural background, the strategic place to go, he goes to the river, and he finds Lydia from the city of Thyatira. She said, come and stay at my house, and she persuaded us. It's that persuaded us thing that I get. Look, Lydia was, I just trust me, Lydia was not his strategic target. If you've heard about uh, Saddleback Church and Saddleback Sam, this is not Saddleback Sam, trust me. There's nothing strategic about Lydia. For one thing, she's not from Philippi. She's from Thyatira. She's a foreigner. She is a woman, and in that culture, she did not have influence because of her gender. Thankfully, that has changed. And she's someone who was apparently the head of her household. She was a dealer in purple cloth. She owned a business. And I just want you to know that those ingredients for Paul, those added up to this isn't the person that I'm going to convert this whole city with. I mean, that's just my sense. But I say it because of what's there. She had to persuade him to come eat something with their family. I mean, she prevailed upon him. I'm just saying this wasn't his choice. And do you know what happens in Philippi after that? It's like this huge comedy of errors. Paul goes to preach. So in Acts um, 16 is where all that is. So this is the background of the book of Philippians. Um, so in Acts 16, he's, he's wanting to preach. He starts preaching, and all of a sudden, this teenage girl starts following him and shouting. You remember this? All right, some of you? And she's saying, he, you know, he really is representing the Lord and the, the God of all gods. And, and I love what verse 18 says in Acts 16. It says, she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed. Can I just say that about the hero Apostle Paul? I know you've never seen a pastor annoyed. This is good. Thankful for that. So annoyed that he turned around and said to the Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. The only reason he healed her is because he was annoyed. She was bad press. This is not strategic. That's his second convert, a teenager that he wanted to get lost. You know what happens after that? Because she had this prophetic gift that other people could make money off of her, they lost their money-making potential. So what they do? They threw him in jail. Who's the third convert? The jailer. <laughs> I mean, does any of this sound really strategic to you? It's remarkable what happens. But Paul just keeps moving forward in faith. I pray that we can do that too. I want to leave us for a moment in silence and invite the Spirit to speak to us individually. You know, some of you may be thinking more in terms of what you're going through in your personal life than what Meridian Friends is trying to do corporately, and that's okay. However the Lord is speaking to you at this moment through any of this is really good with me. 
I've been reading from Psalm 23 the last several weeks as a prayer. I'm going to switch that over for at least a little bit to Psalm 90. And I think this speaks to our season of waiting right now and looking for God's vision. So let me read these two verses from Psalm 90. My dear friends, Gil and Louise George introduced this phrase to me. Establish the work of our hands. Isn't that a good prayer for us right now? I really think God's shown us a vision. So now it's up to the Lord to establish the work of our hands. And then I'll leave you alone in silence for a minute. Psalm 90, verse 16 and 17. May your deeds, brilliant friends, be shown to your servants, those whom we are serving, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands.